Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson, and I'm honored to welcome you to the 2022 Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference. This is UCLA's largest annual conference focused on the Greater China region. We're very pleased to host this year's Wu Conference again, with its focus on technology lessons that all of us can learn from the Greater China region, which it's fair to say is in the midst of a rapid technology-driven transformation sparking the digitization of many companies and industries and enabling new business models. In the coming years, and even now, the region's innovations will not only shape its own digital landscape, but serve as a reference point for digital ecosystems around the world. That ability to influence others and work across boundaries is part of the legacy of the WU Conference, and it highlights the importance we place on key partnerships, including our relationships with alumni, industry, leader, industry leaders, our faculty, and our academic centers at Anderson, including the Center for Global Management, which organized today's conference, along with the Easton Center for Technology Management. It's all part of a broader initiative at UCLA Anderson to increase our ability to work across boundaries of all kinds, to learn, teach, and work across academic disciplines, to work with the many innovative programs and schools here at UCLA, to connect academia and industry, to work across geographies, and to connect the worlds of business and our broader society. We believe these are key leadership imperatives that our students and community must appreciate and excel at. And these sorts of broad leadership explorations would not be possible without the long-term and generous support of the family of Wilbur K. Wu, whose legacy we celebrate with this annual conference. Wilbur Wu was born in 1916 in a village near Guangzhou, in Southern China. And in 1942, he received his bachelor's degree in business administration from UCLA. He became a major figure in LA's business, political, cultural, and charitable arenas. And he was known for decades of leadership in the Chinese American community. About 20 years ago, knowing that China's economy was modernizing and expanding very rapidly, Wilbur Wu, who was the vice chairman of Cathay Bank, and his wife, Beth, endowed the Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference at UCLA. Wilbur and Beth Wu said they were motivated in part, in part by their gratitude for the training Wilbur had received at his alma mater. The Wu's are represented today by their son, Michael Wu. The Wu's family's goal was and remains a desire to facilitate dialogue, promote understanding, and strengthen the important ties between the Greater China region and the United States to identify areas of collective opportunity, foster cooperation, and bring a group of leaders, both aspiring and current, together to collaborate and learn. The Wu Conference has continued to have a powerful influence on our community here at UCLA and beyond. As we begin this year's conference, I'd like to thank all the guest speakers and moderators who are joining us from all over the world, including alumni, faculty, and other distinguished guests. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsor, Newport Asia LLC, our silver sponsor, Cathay Bank, and our partners, including the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, the China General Chamber of Com Commerce, Los Angeles, the UCLA Asia Pacific Center, as well as our student organizations, UCLA's China Students and Scholars Association and Anderson's Greater China Business Association. And a special thank you to the Wu family for their continued support and enthusiasm for the conference this year and every year. Finally, let me welcome and thank each of you for joining us, whether you're a student, faculty member, an Anderson alum, or a member of industry. We appreciate your engagement and interest in the conference. It's now my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend of Anderson's, a pioneer in Los Angeles political circles, and a strong and positive force in the Los Angeles community. Michael Wu was the first Asian American elected to the Los Angeles City Council. He is Dean Emeritus of the College of Environmental Design at Cal Poly Pomona, Pomona, and he is the son of Wilbur and Beth Wu. We're so grateful to Michael and to the Wu family for endowing this important conference and for their years of engagement, support, and partnership with UCLA Anderson. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dean Bernardo. Uh, once again, I'm delighted to convey words of welcome from the family of the late Wilbur and Beth Wu, who endowed this conference. For those of you who didn't know him, Wilbur Wu was deeply proud to be a UCLA 
alumnus. He was born in China and intended, he attended his first two years of college at the old Lingnan College in Guangzhou, one of the early Western style colleges in the United States in China, started by Western missionaries. Then dad transferred to UCLA. At that time, there weren't many Chinese students on the campus back then. But uh, in, in general, the Chinese were not welcome in Westwood. So dad had to live in an apartment south of downtown LA and commute via bus to and from Westwood. Back in those days, young people probably didn't use the word platform to describe an institution of higher education. But UCLA really did provide the essential platform for my father to launch a successful career in business and his years of community leadership. He always thought that his support for this conference was one tangible way for him to give something back to his alma mater, which had opened up so many doors for him. So as for the technology theme of the conference, my father probably wouldn't have identified with it personally. He always depended on others to set his tele television settings. He never figured out how to use the GPS system on his Lexus, and he retired before it became necessary for him to set up an email account. But he knew that technology was becoming increasingly important, and he would have been happy to know that this year's conference would, regret, would address the greater China region's contributions to the world of technology. There is one thing about China's role in the world that I would love to have been able to discuss with my father. Ever since Bill Clinton was in the White House, American presidents have declared their intention to reset U.S. foreign policy to pay more attention to China and the Asia Pacific region. And yet that strategic intention always gets thwarted when reality from another part of the world intervenes. For 20 years, it was the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks and the subsequent, subsequent war on terror coming out of the Middle East. Now it's Russia that has returned to center stage. All the more reason why this conference is an, as an annual opportunity to consider China's role in the world economy and the implications for the US is such a worthwhile service to UCLA and the larger community. So on behalf of the Wu family, thank you, Dean Bernardo, thanks to Lucy Allard and to the Anderson School students for keeping Wilbur Wu's vision alive. Next, we'll hear from Professor Terry Kramer, faculty director of the Easton Technology Management Center, who provided so much of the intellectual leadership for this year's conference. Professor Kramer. Michael, a big uh, thank you. And let me first just start out in saying thank you for your vision on this conference and your unending support of the conference and the school and its, uh, and its broader mission. And let me also just say thank you to Dean Bernardo. Uh, Tony has done an incredible job of building bridges of all types, bridges across Anderson, bridges across UCLA as an institution, bridges across the Pacific. And all of these bridges have created huge opportunities for learning for the UCLA community. Now with the ongoing effects of COVID-19, we've had to adjust a variety of our approaches at UCLA, whether that be our in-country global immersions, our conferences, our classroom instruction, all to ensure safety of the broader UCLA community and our partners. Now, as any technologist knows, necessity is the mother of invention. So again, this year we've moved the conference online. We're excited that these sessions will be available to students, educators, policymakers, and other interested people all around the world, including China. And the developments in the greater China region couldn't be more notable and critical for learnings today. And I'm personally excited about the theme of this conference, new normals and new models, technology learnings from the greater China region. During this conference, we're gonna explore the latest impact of technology on three key constituents, consumers, enterprises, and society in the region. 
and with the profound effect of COVID-19 to better understand new normals. How and where will technology adoption be, become part of a new way that we experience services of all types, whether that be commerce, healthcare, entertainment, or other areas? And relatedly, the digital transformations that many companies are going through to meet this new digital reality. We're also going to discuss the broader role of technology in society itself. As more people experience the impact, good and bad, of technology and how companies and societies are seeking to enhance the good and minimize the bad. Notable changes in the public policy landscape in the greater China region should be highly instructive for all of us. I can remember my days when I worked at Vodafone with its 28 wireless country operations globally and the imperative to learn about best practices from markets across the world, to adapt them to your own market and to advance the cause of technology innovation for everyone. I hope that this week's WU conference will give you a glimpse into the successes in the greater China region and learnings for all of us. Now to accomplish all of this, we've organized the conference into three days during this week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday evening Pacific time. So obviously that's Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday morning in the greater China region. Each day will have its own focus. Today's focus will be on a broader look at innovation in the region, as well as growing innovation in e-commerce. Thursday's focus will be on innovation in transportation and finance. And Friday will center on the many changes in public policy and the regulatory environment in the region and impact on technology companies and innovation. Each session is going to have impressive leaders speaking, followed by a moderated Q&A. Our moderators are leaders in their own right here at UCLA and from industry. Finally, a couple of ground rules and philosophical underpinnings of this conference and at UCLA more broadly. First of all, the US-China relationship is a long and deep one. With any relationship, there can be complexities and areas of disagreement, especially within a community as diverse as UCLA. These differences are understandable and appreciated. We are hoping to build the positive channels between the US and China with this conference in an area of mutual interest, technology innovation, especially in the areas of societal need. We hope learnings in this area will help each of us on our leadership journey and also to build a deeper understanding of the region and innovation. As such, we'll be focusing the discussion and the related Q&A on areas of technology-based innovation, avoiding polarizing topics which could derail us from the important insights and learnings we have set as objectives. We appreciate your understanding and alignment around this vision and norms for the conference. I hope you enjoy the conference, contribute and engage with it, and that this conference builds our collective understanding of the transformative impact that technology can have on consumers, enterprises, and society. And now I'd like to introduce the first session with some important context to set the stage for our discussion on technology innovation and the future of growth in the greater China region. I'll first cover a few technology trends and challenges in the region, and then provide a formal introduction of our distinguished speaker, Jennifer Zhu Scott. So first of all, the pandemic and supply chain issues, the great resignation and COVID closures have all accelerated digital transformations. When you look at IT spending in 2021, it increased by almost 10% worldwide compared to 2 to 5% in the previous years. In addition, China's growth in technology innovation is tremendous, making it well positioned for the future of innovation. Despite the economy being hurt during the pandemic, China's GDP has grown from 2% to more than 8% last year. Both its mobile penetration and internet penetration rates exceed 80%, and there are almost 1 billion internet users in the greater China region alone. Super apps such as WeChat are mainstream in China that provide e-commerce, digital payments, food delivery, healthcare, and mobility services, all of this creating an explosion of consumer data. 
Finally, China is winning the 5G race, which is critical for implementation of connected devices like autonomous vehicles, virtual reality, and enterprise applications. However, Chinese tech companies now face major challenges with increased regulation around antitrust, social networks, gaming, and privacy, with many companies facing significant fines and various penalties for violation. This is also true in the EU and growing in the US, and we'll discuss, discuss the potential impact in more detail with our guest. Let me now give three uh, final trends, technology trends in the region to set up this session. First of all, the great retail integration. This is gonna be an integration of the omni-channel economy, discrete retail sectors like brick and mortar uh, stores, e-commerce and social uh, networks with the on-demand economy to provide seamless experience for consumers. There'll be a massive push for supply chain agility to meet more frequent and diverse on-demand orders and to significantly narrow gaps between on-demand economy and traditional e-commerce and retail. The second major trend, the digitization of social interactions. Chinese big tech companies are building portfolios that merge gaming, e-commerce, and social into a metaverse ecosystem. Local governments are increasing budgets for digital innovation in the metaverse to fuel local economies and a new digital race is de uh, developed with more than 450 new Chinese companies forming to focus on the metaverse in the last year alone. Final key technology trend, the virtualization of services. There'll be an acceleration of education and healthcare services through data, AI, and virtualization. There'll be a drive towards more personalized adaptive services using AI and a push to reach rural areas for equitable access through virtualized services. Now with that context, let me now introduce our esteemed guest. Jennifer Zhu Scott is the executive chairman of the Commons Project, a nonprofit public trust to build digital goods as a public service. She is the founder of Radiant Partners, a private direct investment firm focusing on artificial intelligence. She has contributed significantly to the global technology community and led multiple initiatives to build awareness and solutions for ethics in technology and data ownership. She's had a distinguished career with many accolades and accomplishments. She's a Forbes World Top 50 Women in Tech in 2018 and a co-chair of the Fortune Global Tech Forum in 2019. She's a China Fellow of the Aspen Institute and has a dual fellowship at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. She's a frequent public speaker and has published, authored on data ownership, AI, and digital monetary policies. Her TED Talk, what, Why You Should Get Paid for Your Data, was released in 2020. She studied applied mathematics at Sichuan University and received her MBA in finance at Manchester Business School. She completed multiple public policy and leadership programs at Yale, Harvard, and Oxford. She also graduated from the Executive Program on Sustainable Energy and Leadership at Princeton. An interesting fun fact about Jennifer, she was a consultant on seasons five and six of the HBO show Silicon Valley. In terms of the format for today's session, um, Jennifer's going to give a, a, a variety of opening comments to help set context. I then will ask her a variety of questions to better understand her perspective, and then we'll go to a moderated Q&A. We'll take questions from the audience using the Slido platform. So you'll see Slido embedded at the bottom of your screen. You can either type in your own question or you can upvote one of the existing ones. And I'll endeavor to pose the most popular questions. So Jennifer, a huge welcome. I've been looking forward to this. Let me now turn it over to you for your uh, opening comments. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, Mr. Wu, Dean Bernardo, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I listened to the opening and I realized this is a long tradition of, um, you know, carrying from Mr. Wu's father to uh, build bridges and, uh, you know, between US and China. 
um, our world is uh, more unstable, um, you know, than the past few decades, and we're in a quite dangerous juncture. <clears throat> and I think, you know, for uh, people like ourselves to dabble both between the two superpowers, um, it is absolutely my honor to be able to play a small part of this very important uh, dialogue with such a long tradition. So to open um, this discussion, I just have a very quick four slides to share some of the um, data to, to throw out some numbers to, uh, for us to um, discuss. <clears throat> Number one is um, in terms of the global uh, comparison, yeah, we all know that China's uh, digital payment transaction, the volume is enormous, but uh, very rare, you know, very rarely we actually talk about com in, in comparison, uh, you know, with the U.S., but also more importantly, compare with the Visa and MasterCard's combined global volume. So I have the figures from uh, 2016 to uh, 19. Um, this is the U.S. number in 16 is 112 billion. 17 is 300 plus billion and 18 was 500 billion and 19 uh, grew to 600 billion. And China's number though, uh, in 2016 was already 23 trillion. 17, 28 trillion, 18, 40 trillion and uh, 19 was 50 trillion. So how big that number is, um, let's compare with the Visa and MasterCard's global combined volume. Uh, in 17 was um, uh, 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 12 trillion and um, 18 was 14 trillion and 19 was 15 trillion. So the number, I, I could not find a credible uh, volume number for 2020 yet, but I estimate that number will be even bigger because uh, COVID uh, really pushed everybody to um, you know, conduct a lot of the daily activities online. Now, the second set of uh, data I want to show is in 2021, in terms of uh, uh, comparison of the global investment in energy transition uh, by country. Now, um, we all know that China has made this um, uh, by 2060 will become net zero. So what are the actions we have seen since they made this um, pledge? So um, this is a, this is a, a two thousand you know last year um, China has invested more than double in terms of energy transition uh, compared to the U.S. and uh, for the rest of the you know other countries um, they don't even come close in terms of the actual you know infrastructure investment. <clears throat> and now this is a um, wind installation in twenty twenty one. So. The global output of the wind, um, uh, you know, the renewable energy pr produced the wind is about um, 21 gigawatts. And amongst which China, you know, in terms of the wind installation last year uh, was uh, more than 80%. And the next one, UK is 10%. And then you go all the way to the darkest con con you know, the color uh, within that very you know, thin strip. Um, my child actually didn't even recognize that part. That part was the is the rest of the world combined together. Now I wanna remind that part include the US right, in terms of when install installation. The next one is, um, those are the couple of um, announcement came out um, in 2020, uh, Q1, Q2 in 2020. And um, at that time, of course, the world was consumed by the news of um, COVID. So those you know, statements and announcements largely be missed by global media. The first one is this article written by the chief researcher of uh, PBOC, China Central Bank's Digital, um, Digital Currency Institute. And um, he basically talked about each individual create big data and through mutually verified economic value reports in each individual's blockchain enabled super accounts to define the value created by individual in the, is the essence of digital currency. So translate this into layman language is basically what he's talking about is that the essence of digital RMB, and I hope all, you know, all of us have heard about this digital RMB initiative, um, the essence of digital RMB is really to link the economic value of individual's data to the monetary policy. Now, another um, statement coming out from State Council uh, in end of the March um, in um, 2020, 
is talking about the key means of production in China, a land, labor, capital, technology, and data. So here's the last slide I wanna share. Um, uh, for those who don't know, this is uh, the headquarter of um, Beijing uh, Genetic Institute, BGI. Uh, I have been saying for years, one of the most important geopolitical events will happen is with this company, BGI. So they, they're doing um, quite remarkable genetic um, you know, breakthroughs within this institute. And uh, what the other thing they have been doing is that they publish uh, China's genome bank, bank. This is actually available to the world. Um, they have been sequencing not only just you know, human DNA, but also all the plants, um, viruses, um, different kind of diseases, et cetera. And they are making you know, those kind of genome bank to public. So earlier this year, um, Chinese government in Beijing has um, announced that uh, DNA data is national resource. So I just want to share this few um, uh, this few um, uh, slides to as a kind of conversation opener um, to show some of the you know details that we might not hear from the uh, headlines in media. So Terry, let's have this conversation and um, see our audience what they what they're interested to know. Excellent, excellent. And Jennifer, there's a bunch of areas I want to get more thoughts from you because you've got a very interesting background across multiple areas of technology innovation, multiple geographies, public and private ventures, et cetera. Um, let me start actually just with a little bit more on your background, because you know, you've got a very interesting vantage point that allows you to kind of look across all these areas and develop a, a point of view. Just tell us a little bit more about your journey and how, how you got to where you got to. Thank you, Terry. I actually watched the video, the intro video of Shenzhen, the O Shenzhen. I got a little bit emotional because um, I did not, I did not watch that. That was the first time I watched the video. Um, after I graduated from Central University studying applied math, and I co-funded my first company um, focused on education, and um, Shenzhen was my first stop in opening, you know, my company. And um, you see that most. Uh, impressive, you know, streets with all the uh, skyscrapers um, on that street. It's called Futian Road, right? Mm -hmm. So my office 20 plus years ago was on that road. Across the road was the fields. And literally, you know, I overlooked from my, my window and I could see some, you know, farmers are working in the field. And needless to say, how much change has uh, occurred in the past 40 years, right? And uh, especially in the past 20 years, Shenzhen really has become this um, global hub, at least for hardware. And um, I started from, from China and, you know, back then in the 90s, uh, China was not where we are today. And I wanted to see the world. So I moved to UK um, and worked in the UK for, for a few years. Um, so... Uh, from there and moved back, I, my heart was still in Hong Kong, in Asia, so I moved to Hong Kong. And um, my last corporate job was um, uh, head of strategy for Thomson Reuters. And we invested, uh, our CEO at that time, he later on became eBay CEO, Devin Winnick. Um, he invested, you know, he, under his leadership, we invested about 100 million into, um, at that time, in, 2009, 2008, 2009, nobody was talking about artificial intelligence. We're already using speech recognition, um, you know, deep indexing to try to completely uh, transform um, this, um, you know, global cell site, how they share their um, research. So from there, <clears throat> that really um, connected with my original, you know, background with uh, math and science and technology, always interested. So um, my path after that, you know, from uh, funding my second company, uh, Direct Investing AI, and, um, you know, working right now as executive chair for the Commons Project, um, all has been quite organic, quite natural, because um, <clears throat> if you pay attention to where the forces are really transforming the world. Um, it's uh, it's technology, and um, and I don't I don't only want to focus on what technology can do. I also want to focus on 
you know, what is the role technology should be. So that's uh, that's how um, it kind of drive, drove me to uh, chair this uh, nonprofit um, for building, you know, digital service and public good. Excellent. It explains your expansive view about technology and its uh, its role. Let me now ask you, getting into some of the specifics, you get a chance to see some of the latest technology-based innovation. You see AI and healthcare and education. You look at high-speed mobile networks, social commerce. What are the areas of technology-based innovation that you're most excited about? I think um, uh, obviously AI is going to become ubiquitous, right? Every um, uh, whenever there is a company, um, they pitch me as they are AI company. Um, I think it's almost become uh, redundant because any of the new company they should just consider how you apply AI. It's a little bit like uh, electricity, right? Um, you know, every company is supposed to use this uh, foundational technology. Um, I also think, you know, uh, technology applying in healthcare, drug discovery, using AI, using big data is going to be a very, very exciting, you know, area as well. Um, the third area, I think, um, decentralized approach. So a lot of Web3 approach. Um, Web3 is still in the very, very early stage, but what Web3 gave us um, is a potential promise that we could shift to this very centralized um, you know, tech world that we have witnessed the large tech companies control everything to uh, empowering individual, um, you know, using individual as the most foundational unit to produce, um, you know, from ownership to access to uh, economic value, et cetera. So, so we're not there yet. Uh, Web3 still, you know, Regardless of this great promise, um, a lot of um, um, applications, the users are still very limited, right? The joke is that never ask a woman about her age and never ask a man about her, his salary and never ask a Web3 funder about how many users they have. Uh, so <laughs> so it, is, it is the early stage, but I think, you know, those three areas will be, you know, most exciting, I think. Yeah. And, and let me ask you, Jennifer, to juxtapose your first comment about AI will be everywhere. And then Web 3.0, which is kind of empowering the individual, their data, their ownership. Are they actually orthogonal, i.e., will it be difficult for people to say, hey, I'm going to want to share my data to power this AI revolution? Or no, these actually go fairly well together. I think um, we have gone through this digital economy 1.0 where large companies providing platform, we all thought it was free. But then, you know, in the recent few years, we all realized, hang on a second, it's not free at all. It's your attention, your time, your mental health, um, your privacy. So um, I profoundly believe that, you know, as we shift into the new generation of digital economy, um, individuals have to be able to renegotiate this social contract, which means maybe I don't need to, you know, you to provide that uh, service for free, especially the price I'm actually paying with my privacy and my children's, uh, you know, mental well-being is too dear. So I'd much rather pay $10 a month to, you know, subscribe your service, but don't take my data, uh, don't manipulate my vote, um, don't, you know, manipulate my children's um, uh, uh, psychology. And um, as a result, I think, um, to realize and are working towards this individual's data ownership, starting by empowering individual to access their health data, their you know, personal data, um, and then control where they share their data. Um, it will be very important pillar to be to build a more inclusive and more healthy digital economy. We're not there yet, but I do think the world from, you know, even with very different regulatory response, response from China, US and Europe, um, and also individual, you know, also collectively start to realize this is a raw deal we went into with Facebook and with Twitter and with Tencent, and how can we have the alternative, right? So I think the world's, you know, have realized this, but we haven't yet seen um, a good solution that's um, uh, really scale on a global scale yet. But yeah, I think that that's actually where the opportunity is. 
Yeah. And on that topic, Jennifer, do you think we'll, you know, we've lived through this whole phase of the free model, that data has allowed a lot of free applications and social networks and search is free and all that. Do you think we'll start at a macro level seeing a kind of shift back to subscription models that people are actually going to have to pay for services and they're going to monetize in other ways? Yeah, I think uh, Shushana Zuboff, uh, in her book, um, Civilians Capitalism, she, she described the problem very, very well, right? Um, you know, a lot of us say, oh, if you're not paying for the service, you're not the, you're not customer, you're the products. But she argues that you're actually not even the product, you are raw material, you know, you basically supplying, you know, all the data, um, the services need to, you know, introduce. So, what needs to happen is um, um, for a lot of those services um, start to think about, let me actually, let's actually build not only just technology, but also governance model, allow individual to control access. And then eventually there could be a way for um, uh, individual to, to trade or um, you know, sell their data at their own will then I think you probably will become a much different, you know, digital society. There are companies in Europe, um, namely they're, you know, like uh, Ocean Protocol, et cetera, they're already building, um, you know, this kind of uh, in, empowering individual data exchange, right? Um, I give you a practical example, uh, which is a multi-billion dollar sector, you know, part of the uh, pharmaceutical industry, clinical trial. So clinical trial, when they look for health data for people to you know, participate in a certain type of clinical trial, is a very inefficient process. And they can generate a lot of data, but the data is usually not relevant. But if we can create a marketplace, that individual can actually, based on the um, requirement <clears throat> and uh, submit um, the type of data those pharmaceutical companies are looking for and get paid based on, you know, your preference, how much you want to, you want to get paid, does the price, you know, represent the fair price or not. And then that create a very different dynamic, right? Um, so I do think that um, to not necessarily have to go back to subscription model, but to shift the business model away from that, you know, the pretend uh, free services, but actually respect of what's most valuable for you, which is your privacy mm -hmm. and your free will um, is uh, the direction we should go. Excellent. Excellent. Let me ask you about another area of technology-based innovation, and that's the metaverse. Obviously, there's a lot of focus about kind of this digital environment that we'll be able to shop in and work in and, and uh, go to school in, et cetera, et cetera. Say more about your view on the metaverse. How important is it? When will we see it? What will happen in the greater China region versus elsewhere? So right now it is estimated that China, in China alone, the next 10 years, metaverse will be at 8 trillion, uh, estimated 8 trillion uh, market. Um, as we speak, there are about 16,000 trademarks related to metaverse being filed in China at the moment. Um, Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, about metaphor first. I think um, um, for sure there will be areas that, you know, for example, gaming, right? People already in that world um, will start to, um, you know, feel very uh, natural to, to emerge into that world, right? But I'm skeptical that, you know, people will wearing a goggle, um, you know, conduct a lot of their daily activity. If we think in the last 10, you know, 15 years, everybody have their head down and looking on the phone is bad enough. Um, you know, imagine, you know, everybody actually completely block your sight with your, uh, with the, with a goggle, right? Mm -hmm. The, the niche in, you know, maybe, maybe not the niche, you know, the, the, the differentiated approach in this area, I think, you know, Apple's um, um, uh, VR glass or AR glass yeah. glasses, so they use mixed um, reality, which is um, um, not necessarily blocking your site, but actually, you know, mix your reality with the information and lay data layer on top. That could be the, you know, uh, more useful direction to go. Now in China, there are a lot of um, uh, large um, uh, tech companies that are pursuing this direction as well, right? So for example, Alibaba is really focusing on 
um, hardware. So we just bought a company that produced um, AR glasses. And um, Tencent is really, you know, uh, focused on gamify. Um, how to use um, um, uh, metaverse to create this completely, you know, um, tense and universe of um, of games. Um, but the exciting part is actually um, those small startups in China, uh, like uh, BUD, like Yuhaha, etc. Um, they are creating really innovative uh, from small games to small interactions. Um, you know, with the uh, social social commerce, etc. I think you know those are the companies to to watch out for, right? Although you know, having said that, as I said it earlier, overall, um, I we have a you know Gargo and Home as well, and uh, I think we're just not there yet to create this kind of a seamless experience. Um, uh, if um, if the audience is interested, you know, go on YouTube. You can search. There's a whole genre of the videos, people, um, you know, falling over and hitting themselves on the wall, wearing, <laughs> wearing the glasses. Um, so I think there's a lot of, um, lot of hype um, in this space. Um, also, I think you know anything that Facebook is trying to convince you to to do, um, I pause. Anything <laughs> that Facebook is trying to get you to do, you take pause on it. Say more yeah. about that. Um, <clears throat> I think Facebook has to be the villain um, in the last generation of digital economy, right? And um, uh, we have seen, particularly in the U.S., we have seen not only just the damage on the individual, but also in the entire democracy, um, the kind of the role they have, um, they have, um, uh, you know, involved in. And um, if we think about, um, I always feel, you know, this is a real shame of uh, our generation. If we think about um, with climate change, you know, hunger problems, um, improve education, there are so many real global problems that need to be solved and using technology to be solved. But the brightest minds, a uh, whole generation of brightest minds has been devoted into ad clicks for Facebook and you know, for other social media companies. So um, <clears throat> I think, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm not a friend of Facebook, and you know I think um, a company like this really should become obsolete when there are more and more companies that actually empower, respect individuals, um, your digital sovereignty, right? Yeah. Um, you know, self sovereignty. So, so yes. So when Facebook tell us, you know, getting to metaverse. Um, I feel very skeptical. <laughs> yeah, no, very, very helpful. And I'm going to, you know, start to ask you about companies and which companies you're keen on and which ones not. Let me, let me dive deeper on Facebook and broadly social networks, because obviously it's going to be a big issue about, you know, fake news and misinformation, disinformation, political intrusions, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think the solution is there? Knowing, I mean, you've done a lot of business in the U.S. You know, on one side, you've got concern about free speech. Um, and that's a constitutional right. And the other side, you have something that is damaging to society. I think most people, both sides of the political spectrum would say, what is the solution in your mind to the issues of the social network in the US? Uh, let me ask you, let, let me tell you what is not the solution. Uh, uh, the solution is not Elon Musk. And um, uh, we cannot, uh, swap a king with an emperor, right? And uh, the fundamental problem is that, um, you know, if we think about Twitter or Facebook, a lot of those social media companies, they behave more like a public square. They, they feel like a public square, but guess what? The ultimate um, objectives of those companies is actually maximize your time on site, make you hook up with your, you know, uh, dopamine. And mm -hmm. so you, when you are staring at scrolling through those apps, the advertisement gets sold more, right? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of research has showed that um, when people are angry, um, they tend to stay you know, on those social media much longer. It's not because when they see something nice and beautiful, when people are angry, they keep wanting to 
debate and argue. And, you know, this is particularly on, on Facebook, right? So Facebook has been pushing out, um, deliberately pushing out very extreme, very uh, provocative, you know, uh, those articles or statements. And the same on Twitter, right? If we go on, every time, I, you know, I use Twitter and I learn a lot from people I follow on Twitter. However, whenever I go on Twitter, I always feel like, oh my God, World War III is about to happen. And, you know, this is the end of the world, right? Give you very unreal, um, this kind of um, uh, uh, world view where everything, you know, how bad everything's going. It's actually not really necessary because everything's bad. It's because these kind of, um, you know, tweets or posts that generate more views. And so you think you have this free will, but your free will is actually an illusion. And your, free, your so-called quote-unquote free will is built on um, what kind of ads will get so, you know, uh, at the best price, right? So, so I do think that um, uh, we are at this juncture that, you know, with the social media, the change has to come from the system uh, instead of, um, you know, which shareholder, um, we, who, who will be the next messiah to, to, you know, change that company, right? So um, we also have to realize that uh, technology has been transformative to every aspect of life. Of course, some of the digital services should be commercial, should be, you know, introduced with um, a very wide competition in order to benefit the customers. However, there are also certain type of services should be regarded as public, you know, infrastructure, mm -hmm. and uh, it should become nonprofit. Um, part of what we are doing is trying to establish that, that norm, right? And I think mm -hmm. Signal, it's another very good example. A signal, basically, um, you know, WhatsApp's co-founders, they basically put money and, you know, Signal is completely uh, nonprofit. So they will not take your data and it's completely private. And I think this is the first example. And I hope there will be many of this kind of example to take certain part of the digital services um, as public infrastructure. If, talk to, if you talk to you know, conscious Googlers, um, many of them will tell you it's very strange um, to work there because mm -hmm. uh, public access information, it really not supposed to be, you know, a, a private company's uh, monopoly to, to maximize the ad dollar, right? And same in China as well, you know, direct uh, connected to, you know, political initiatives, et cetera. And um, ended up, you know, our society, as long as digitalized, we all suffer the same thing, which is um, um, our view, uh, the way we see what the world is happening is really being um, deliberately presented this, this very polarized um, extreme views because mm -hmm. Guess what? That's that's the, the type of news will hook you, you know, on those platforms for the longest time. Yeah. Jennifer, where do you think the failure occurred with social networks, with Facebook? Was it government failure to not regulate candidly? Was it a failure of leadership not to have a North Star and to self-police? Was it a failure of people and individuals not to be responsible about how they're engaging with social networks? Where do you see the failure and maybe the fix occurring? Yeah, I think it's all of the above, to be honest. Um, and um, I probably want to, you know, obviously government regulation can set the floor, but regulation is uh, not the answer for everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, individual, we all went into those kind of uh, convenience of digital services without really think through, you know, what does that mean when I start to share every, my behavior, you know, every and then private company know uh, mm -hmm. things that I don't even know about myself, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think people, individuals are learning about this. Uh, however, I do think that, you know, for our students um, in the audience who are thinking about starting your own tech companies or joining any, you know, uh, uh, tech companies, um, the hard lesson I have learned and, um, you know, over the years investing and, you know, talking and helping a lot of companies is that the character of the leader of the company uh, is something that sooner or later eventually will show, right? If, there, if there's the lack of character um, and uh, only focus on, you know, why you should maximize your profit or, 
um, uh, focus on the commercial return without considering the customer's well-being or societal well-being, you will eventually show. So I do think this, um, uh, you have to, you know, do do good uh, in order to do well, um, should be everybody's um, uh, motto, right? And um, the good news is that in a lot, as the world moving to, uh, towards um, net zero and, um, uh, you know, consumers' awareness is more and more on, you know, what is good for the society. I actually think there's a huge space for uh, tech companies to, to do well because they do good, uh, not, you know, despite of they doing, doing good. Yeah. Um, so, I think, you know, a lot of the social media companies, they, they really failed on, on that front. Yeah. And let me ask on that, you know, kind of your view about tech companies, both in the greater China region, the U.S. or even elsewhere, which companies are you impressed with? Impressed with in terms of their innovation, their growth, and also responsible behavior? And which ones are you not impressed with, worried about their growth, worried about their innovation, worried about their lack of responsibility? And I know Facebook is on the second list, but um, who, are, who are the other people on both lists? I think, you know, in China, uh, companies like Alibaba and Meituan um, have become, uh, Alibaba is mostly an antitrust, right? And uh, of course, we also have a, you know, founder who's uh, uh, very high profile or used to be very high profile. Um, mm -hmm. That costs a lot of uh, negative attention. And um, companies like Meituan, they delivering, you know, services for uh, food delivering services. And uh, in order, you know, um, in order to get um, the those gig workers, they already paid a minimum wage to arrive, um, you know, deliver food to like two, three minutes earlier, faster. Um, they their algorithm made them to riding by, you know, motorcycle, taking those illegal breaking traffic rules, illegal, you know, routes, etc., and that becomes such a, you know huge, um, you know, uh, professional hazard for those uh, uh, gig workers. And of course, they have no insurance, right, of, of any form. So I think, um, you know, when, pe when you know, people outside of China reading about uh, cracking down those um, it, the companies like this and the thought, um, you know, China, Chinese government is a cracking down tech companies, but it's actually not. Those companies really have very serious societal problems. It's just, you know, the Chinese regulators decided they really have to do something to, to, um, to stop these kind of behaviors, right? Um, also, for example, with the uh, uh, tutoring, um, to, you know, online tutoring, this, is, this was a huge business in China and um, uh, overnight and they have to become nonprofit. Uh, the, 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 you know, media kind of reported in the way that those said the uh, crack it down private businesses and uh, which, you know, missing the nuance, which is um, a lot of this, um, um, you know, schools in China, um, their teachers are not very well paid. And so they deliberately, they work in the night, right, in those tutoring services, and they deliberately deprive their students during the day school and save mm -hmm. the most important part to teach in the night. So this, you know, this kind of service is actually destroying China's education, right? So I do think, you know, a lot of um, China's, those kind of um, um, the platform, quote, digital platform type of business uh, will have, uh, um, you know, closer scrutiny um, in the coming years uh, from the regulators. And, you know, perhaps most of them, they actually deserve that. The only downside with this process is that uh, when regulators can have such fast implementation and, you know, rapid issuing different regulations in such a short period of time, it does destroy the trust a little bit, right? The market confidence. Um, so I think that's the price we, we are still waiting to see. But, you know, apart from obviously the, you know, Facebook type of social media company, I do think, you know, tech companies like Meituan, et cetera, they have a huge social responsibility to do a lot better than what they have been. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And do you think, you know, China is playing a long game here? Because I think a lot of people in the U.S. would look at the market cap of so many of these luminary Chinese tech companies that have just grown overnight and done so well, have now moved back down again. 
And do you think the Chinese government's kind of saying, hey, listen, we got to get this right for the intermediate and long term, and we're going to take some pain short term? Is that kind of the, the mindset on it? I do think China is playing a long game. And um, the, the regulators are very powerful in China. And um, I think probably starting from two years ago, if you look at CSC, right? So China's uh, uh, you know, cyber um, regulator, um, they have been moving very aggressively. Uh, for example, DD is one of the um, you know, top examples we have watched. Uh, how they they've been punished right by by this um, uh, data localization issues and um, I do think that China has decided you know they watched what's happening in the U.S. and a lot of those tech companies um, ending up not only just um, you know rip off the gig gig workers or you know labor but also um, this massive you know, reach and pull gap in the past 20 years with the digital transformation has actually become much deeper, much wider. And um, I think, you know, China right now, the government wants to see um, how can we avoid that, right? How, how what, what should we think about um, the model and they compare US and Germany. And I think what the government, from where I can see, um, <clears throat> I believe they, they decide they don't want to become the next U.S. Right? They do not. <clears throat> they don't want to have this massive, you know, mega tech companies dominating, you know, a huge part of the economy. But instead, while they look at Germany, they want to have many, you know, valuable companies that are really taking very important part of the supply chain or very important part of the cutting edge techno technology. They're not very big. Uh, in comparison to Amazon and Google and Tencent, but they are they are very um, they are very hard to replace, right? So I think the the shift in China, um, quite contrary to what most of the media is writing about Chinese government's crackdown on tech, um, I think what happening in China right now, the regulator is sending very clear signal that the type of tech business that just, you know, putting a few hundred millions of people with the smartphone together and deliver them some sort of services, either e-commerce or food deliveries or uh, online education, et cetera, they're no longer regarded as innovation. The real innovations are in the hard um, uh, science and tech. So for example, life science, drug discovery, genome, um, uh, space, um, space tech, um, quantum computing, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we will see uh, the next generation of uh, China's uh, tech superstars. They are un unlikely will be, you know, TikTok, or, you know, ByteDance or um, Alibaba type of companies. They're likely to be um, German style, not as big, but massively deep and valuable IP and yeah. very yeah. difficult to replace. I think that's the long game they're playing. So let me test an idea. And it's interesting because in one of my classes, we cover the work of uh, Kareem Lakani and Marco Insidi at Harvard Business School about their book, their work on competing in an age of AI. And basically the argument goes is there's increasing returns to scale with data. And you look at it with Google search as an example, search relevance gets better and better as you have more scale. They also talk about the ability of large co uh, tech companies to move across industry. So uh, Google going into transportation with Waymo, Amazon going into healthcare with Amazon Care. Do you worry that um, kind of, quote unquote, artificially breaking up large tech companies actually will not help the consumer because they'll end up being subscale. Yes, they're not large and kind of domineering, but also the quality of what they provide may be diminished, especially as you get into areas like healthcare or autonomous vehicles and transportation where you need big data sets to really execute well. Do you worry about that? Um, I, I, I don't really worry about that, not because that's not problematic. I I, I think that's uh, that's a, that's assumption fundamentally, you know, miss one thing, which is um, the 
direction of where AI is going, the assumption assumed that uh, the direction AI is going need to be continue to be very data hungry, as we have seen in the past years. Um, but the most exciting area for AI, it's actually not as um, uh, data hungry. So um, if you think about, you know, a good example is this kind of data hungry, the way the way you use you know, massive amount of data to, you know, conduct this kind of pattern recognition um, is actually not very effective and not very efficient, right? Remember a few years ago, uh, Google spent, God knows how much energy to uh, try to tell the difference between blueberry muffin and chihuahua. And uh, uh, and yet, you know, the their AI constantly confusing the pictures of blueberry muffin and chihuahua where two years old child, human child would never make that, you know, um, uh, mistake. So the fundamental difference with that approach is that uh, uh, with human, when we're looking at um, uh, a chihuahua, we see the, you know, the, the texture we see, we hear the sound with this multi -di -di multiple di dimensional uh, type of data, right? And uh, what AI is good at doing right now is use very um, uh, narrow, you know, type of um, uh, data for optimization. So the most exciting area of AI right now, in my view, is actually this sparsity approach, which is to use, um, a fraction of data, but use multiple co columns to build this model, very similar to our frontal cortex, how we recognize the world. We cannot process a lot of data, but the reason we have this kind of very three, you know, three-dimensional understanding of the world is because we have this like column in our frontal cortex to um, to build a model to understand the world, right? So, so I do think that um, this. Uh, sparsity approach might change um, this kind of big data driven, data hungry type of um, um, AI empowered companies. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of to your question, they go to different industries. I think that's kind of inevitable, right? Because we we have already seen that happen in terms of a technology company going to finance, technology company um, actually doing better in terms of uh, space, transportation, etc. We it's a, it's it's inevitable. The question will also come back to um, how are you going to actually serve your customers responsibly. Um, instead of um, you know what's what's the most what's the most sexy you know um, industry you're going to uh, that can attract most attention. Yeah, let me ask you, Jennifer. I know this is getting very philosophical, you know, and maybe psychological, but is all of this basically an argument that you know power corrupts absolutely, and absolute power corrupts that human beings are going to do naughty things, and you can't expect them to kind of you know, do the good things without notable guardrails versus the other argument that says, well, we're talking about some bad players here. Maybe Facebook's an example of it, but there are a bunch of great companies. And in the US, maybe it's say it's Salesforce, maybe Google's a bit better, et cetera. There's a bunch of good leaders, good companies that wanna do good things. What is your view on all this? Is that is that all sound kind of Pollyanna, that latter part that you gotta have these strong guardrails or, or not? I think we have to differentiate uh, how much relying on the good conscience of few individual versus how much we can rely on the system. And I think um, we, we we gotta be able to have both, right? Right now, it's too much on which um, tech you know CEO um, has good conscience. Um, I don't think that's sustainable approach and that's not reliable. That's where I see the Web3 approach to actually build a system. Um, therefore, you know, you will be, it uh, doesn't matter who's going to be, you know, participating in that system, the rules will not change, right? I think Bitcoin is a good example. You know, there's no, it, it blows my mind. We still have no idea who's the Satoshi Nakamoto, right? Um, the person or the group who invented the Bitcoin had the vision that, to truly decentralize, the, even the, the in individual group has to be anonymous, right? So over the years, there has not been a Bitcoin CEO or, you know, Bitcoin Inc., you know, headquarters somewhere. Um, and yet, you know, it still exists, it's still thriving. 
um, and becoming more and more important and be recognized. And I think that's um, regardless where the future will be Bitcoin, but I, I do think that actually set an example. Uh, what about for certain type of digital services? Instead of relying on individual, we're actually relying on the system. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Very, very, uh, very helpful. I want, we've got a lot of questions here. I want to ask you one or two more, and then I'm going to go to the audience um, questions here. So first of all, if you were to look forward and say, what does the world look like in the future technology-based? And you've started to allude to it, but give me kind of your view 10 to 20 years out. What will we see in terms of technology? What will we see in terms of services? What will we see in terms of role of companies and industry and governments, et cetera, et cetera? Wow, that's a very big question. Um, I I want to say that um, I have no idea. Um, It's very hard to even predict what will happen in the next five years. Um, and because there are so many variables that could play, right? And especially right now, we live in a world that's very unstable um, in terms of, um, you know, where geopolitics are heading, in terms of the social conflicts we have to solve. But the the large, this kind of the cycle of the world is that um, in Chinese, we say, you know, if you keep staying on the west bank of um, uh, of the river for 30 years, the chances you become the east bank of the river for 30 years, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I do think that right now we are at the at the end of this kind of a very centralized, a large tech, you know, ultra powerful, um, overrun every aspect of our life. And I think, you know, in the coming years, the the, the voice of uh, having more individualistic, um, empowering individual, giving, you know, a part of the people a type of um, solutions and, and also, go, you know, climate conscious type of solutions um, will be, you know, more and more. And of course, with COVID, I, I do think um, the acceleration in terms of digital health um, and the drug discovery um, will become a, a theme going forward. And this area is also happen to be become more and more individualistic as well, because position medicine, you know, based on individual, based on your individual data. So every everything, every direction I look at, uh, to me, I think is really pointed into how do we enable individual as the unit. And you are the sovereignty to to control and manage your data to enable all the services you will need, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that in a, in a one or two generation from now, um, our our children and um, grandchildren will look back and you know feel very surprised. Wow. You guys just sign up Facebook and you just let children to use Facebook. That's really, really bad. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope that will happen. Excellent. Let me ask you one other one. We have a lot of women at UCLA that want to advance in technology. What is you've obviously been very successful. What what advice would you give them? Great question. Uh, this is uh, something I feel very passionate about. Um, I think, you know, I have two advice. One is um, uh, just be really good on what you do. Forget about your agenda. Um, because the real progress is when we don't have to talk about gender. You're just you just very successful engineer. You're not very successful female engineer. You're a very successful founder. You're not, you know, female mm-hmm. founder. Um, then we win. And um, we have to make this gender as non-issue, right? Um, I think, you know, it's fantastic. There are a lot of initiatives that, uh, you know, enable empower women and take that, you know, make most of it. Um, but once you get into the room, make sure you forget about your gender. You just be the best. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, second advice I want to give is that this is, a, this is actually advice and um, a great mentor I, I, I had some years ago. She's mega successful. And um, one day I was complaining to her and I said, you know, women, there are a lot of women that actually are really tough on each other, right? Um, they are the first one to be on the stage, talk about women empowerment, and they will be the last one to actually help other women. Uh, some women actually enjoy to be the only one in the boardroom. So uh, her advice is that just ignore all of that. And when you find women uh, of talent and integrity, it has to be those two things you make deliberate effort to help them and support them. And then ask nothing in return. 
um, other than ask them to pay forward. So I've been doing this for maybe 15 years and uh, I have seen amazing, amazing, um, this community of women really genuinely supporting each other and celebrate each other's success and not feel threatened, um, which is very, you know, satisfying. So be very proud. We, you know, we, we, we be very proud of our agenda, but, you know, don't make that as the, as an issue. Excellent. Excellent. Very helpful advice. We got a lot of questions. Let me start uh, posing uh, several of them. So Charles, actually one of my students, I uh, got a lot of upvotes. Can you provide some recent examples of how American entrepreneurs have successfully entered and grown their business, their technology in uh, Shenzhen? This is a great question. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think any large, any, you know, in the large scale, right? Um, this is a, a, the reason being, um, you know, hard to have um, this kind of example, you know, successful is because it's multiple reasons, right? And China is a very tough market to get in. It's hyper competitive. And without understanding, you know, the culture, the, uh, you know, competitive landscape and also having all the right connections, it's just super hard. And um, however, I do know that, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, especially on hardware, they use Shenzhen as um, a base for them to produce, you know, prototype, et cetera, as one part of their, you know, innovation. That has been quite effective and efficient. But to start in Shenzhen as an American entrepreneur, I think it's going to be very, very tough, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing, you know, another factor, I, I think this is, of course, a huge generalization, and there are always exceptions and always outliers. But overall, the expectation of how much hard work Chinese entrepreneurs and put, to, put through and American entrepreneurs is very, very different. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. One is um, uh, with my portfolio companies, if I ask some, you know, engineer for something on Sunday night, um, 8 p.m., uh, I will receive what I need by 10 p.m. on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And this would never happen with, um, you know, American, you know, funders or team members. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, um, I buy a lot of things on Taobao. Right, how about basically connect all the entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, small business owners around the country. And um, this is a very, um, this story basically illustrates, you know, the, the level of um, commitment to hard work um, is, um, is completely different compared to the US environment, right? Um, in 2020, I was, uh, you know, COVID just happened. And um, I, I tried to order some curtain, custom-made curtain for my daughter. And I went on Taobao, ordered the curtain, and uh, you can chat in Taobao to say, um, you know, talk to, direct to talk to the vendor. The vendor started to apologize to me and say, Oh, because it's a COVID, we cannot get our workers come to the factory. And, you know, apologies, you know, your curtain will be shipped uh, a little bit later. So that was last Sunday night. I said, oh, no worries. You know, how, how much late, how late do you think um, you'll be able to ship the curtains? And the person on the other, other, other side said, we can only ship tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, so. So you, when you have that, and you know, and if you work in the uh, Shenzhen, those tech companies, nobody has um, ping pong table, nobody has gluten free buffet, right? Uh, people talking about nine nine six. I'm not a big fan of nine nine six. Basically, you work nine to nine and six days a week. Um, but I just think that expectation of hard work is completely different. That's not a factor too. Yeah, I'm just trying to picture you advising the the uh, uh, writers of uh, Silicon Valley with all of the ping pong tables and everything that's there. Oh man, um, yeah, let me that deserves another session. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, let me ask the next one. Uh, this is from Melvin. Melvin's in our uh, UCLA NUS uh, Exec MBA program, and a whole bunch of people upvoted. Um, he said, "With political tensions, when do you think China will overtake the West?" in terms of tech innovation, if they continue to isolate uh, China, or have they already? Uh, thank you, Owen. great question. I think um, um, 
the one advice I, I highly recommend, you know, all of us to do is uh, to separate the the headline to the reality, right? Uh, the headline is all about rhetoric, you know, and if you just rely on your understanding of the world based on the headlines, um, you will see a very different, you know, situation compared to the reality. The reality here is that even with the geopolitical tension, and even there's a lot of Cold War, you know, discussion. And if you look at the history, last time we had a Cold War between uh, USSR and, U and the US, uh, the economic overlap was zero, those two countries. And today, US and China, so integrated, so rely on each other, not only just, you know, economically, but also technology-wise technology and supply chain. And if you look at the, you know, just this is public available information, right? <clears throat> you pull out the biggest tech companies, of course, apart from Facebook, um, you know, Twitter, etc., that, that are banned in China. But if you look at Microsoft, you know, um, uh, companies like Microsoft and um, uh, Telcom, etc., you know, um, you can see the portion of revenue they generate from China market. It's enormous, mm -hmm. right? So. I don't think that real isolation is going to happen. And I don't think there is a very clean cut view to say China is going to overtake the West. Um, if you talk about the renewable energy output, 5G, um, online payment, et cetera, China is already ahead um, by a long miles, right? But also China is really relying on US on many aspects as well. For example, you know, uh, on chips for both AI and phone, et cetera, um, really need to rely on the US, right? And AI research, this is a very, very ironic about prove my point. Um, in terms of AI, most cutting edge research is still in the US. But guess where the research is coming from? They're coming from Chinese researchers who are in the US. So that's how interconnected those two countries are. And I think, you know, one thing if I, if I you know, want to leverage my privilege as the keynote speaker today and, you know, for the conference is that in, in Chinese, we have this uh, phrase called "chou tong chun yi." Basically, means you you embrace um, the uh, the differences, but coexist uh, peacefully. I don't think the U.S. can do well, uh, and the world can do well without a thriving China. And I don't think China can do well without you know um, the. U.S. and uh, the global community working as the community to overcome some much, much bigger uh, challenges, um, you know, such as cancer research, such as climate, et cetera. So <clears throat> if we approach everything based on how do we collaborate, em embrace the differences, but where, are, where we can collaborate and help each other rather than this zero sum race, mm -hmm. you know, either you win or I win, I think our world will be, be a better place. Yeah, good, good philosophy, even uh, between people within a country. Uh, very good philosophy. Let me ask just a couple more because at times uh, uh, we just have a few more minutes here. Uh, David Tan asks a question with healthcare. I see the value of data being shared for the greater good. Um, obviously, with an anonymizing the data, how do you balance paying for people's data with the need to making it a public good, especially in areas like healthcare that can serve society more broadly? Thank you, David, for the great question. Uh, watch my TED talk. <laughs> I, I have uh, specifically talked about this area. I think um, data ownership cannot be complete without this uh, pricing power for individual. When you say pricing power, it's basically allow individual to decide what kind of data I'm going to contribute, what kind of data I'm going to charge, and what kind of data I'm, I'm willing to exchange for some voucher, right? So for example, if it's an um, um, e-commerce company wants to um, give me some voucher and therefore their recommendation will be more relevant, I'm very happy to do that. And uh, if it's a cancer research, um, you know, find my data is actually very valuable to them, I would decide to donate my data, right? If it's Cambridge Analytica wants to use my data to manipulate my vote, then absolutely not, right? I would set my you know, price and, and enormously high for prohibitively high. So the trick in this is naturally not in terms of 
I think the most important trick actually um, is not to have a marketplace. Therefore, everything you know for data. Therefore, everything is solved, right? The trick in here is actually um, to understand that privacy. Uh, is nuanced and it's individual and it's dynamic because you constantly change what you prefer and to give people um, that tool to to basically control and you know who you want to share how much you know would take for you to share what kind of initiative you will share uh, instead of some European uh, parliament members or regulators tell me what is private to me I think it's better to empower the individuals so I do think um, um, uh, you know, once you once individual being empowered to that level, then you know, let the society speak. You know, um, and then I think it's truly digital democracy um, mm-hmm. to to allow individual to um, to decide. You know, where they want to deploy the data. Okay, great. Let me ask one. Uh, let me pose one last question. Uh, this one is from Jong Yoon Park, and he asks. Um, how does regulatory limitations affect further technology innovation in China? How is the trend of regulation changing in favor of innovation or hurting innovation? Um, I think the one uh, area that uh, everybody should pay attention is uh, everything CSC says. Um, so CSC is dis- dis- determining and deciding a lot of in terms of data privacy and data localization. Um, I do think that the trend, as I mentioned earlier, will be very much focus on the type of innovation that's actually hard STEM, right? Hard science and hard uh, technology instead of large platforms. So avoid those large platform type of companies um, because it will become much, much harder for them. They do bear uh, outsized responsibility to the to the uh, society. Also, I think, you know, um, in terms of this data localization uh, regulation, it will make uh, a huge difference in terms of uh, Chinese companies listing in the U.S. and, um, you know, elsewhere. And um, uh, this comes back to, you know, my uh, believe that, you know, for example, if DD decided that in, instead of uh, centralized their users' data, a few hundred millions of users' data, um, they actually just keep all their PII, stay on their phone, and nobody you know, uh, will access that other than their individual, then they would not have this national security argument from the regulator when they list in the US, right? So I do think this is the, uh, in terms of data ownership power struggle in the U.S. is still, you know, tightly in the corporates. In Europe, starts to regulate and say, you know, we have to have a say. Um, in China, they're doing two things. One is that they're 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 having power struggle with the, the corporates, and the government wants to have access to data. In the meantime, they also use initiatives like DGRMB to empower individuals' data ownership and data economy value. So watch carefully, you know, in terms of um, countries like China and India and Africa. Um, India is um, having this India Stack initiative. It's also person-based data, you know, empowerment. And also Africa, obviously, China has a lot of influence in, in those countries. So um, I hope, um, you know, the, the, the future of um, our digital society um, take care of the people rather than just take care of the founders and VC investors um, of this world. Well, well said. Jennifer, let me do this. At the end of uh, any of the sessions I moderate, I always like to share my takeaways, my so what's. Let me share these and give you an opportunity either to upgrade them or to share any parting uh, remarks that you've got. And I've got uh, the so what's in basically three categories. One is your view on areas of innovation. A second is a set of comments about specific companies. Um, And then a third is kind of this area about what the future looks like, as well as your your personal advice. So let me start out with the areas of innovation. Um, First takeaway I got is your comment that AI will become ubiquitous. This is going to be kind of foundational to almost every business that's out there and how they can effectively harness data for uh, for good. Second area of innovation is the idea of Web 3.0. And this view that's also kind of a philosophical view as well as a technology view about the decentralization of technology companies empowering individuals. 
Um, and then uh, neutral to, you know, maybe it's further on uh, on the metaverse, notwithstanding all the hype around it, that that may be a little bit uh, uh, further, uh, further on. Comments about companies that nicely you said Facebook is the villain in the digital economy. They're an example of somebody that's kind of misused data and has created longer term uh, uh, problems. Another comment is there are plenty of companies in China that have been kind of not good as well. And you talked about Meituan as an example on breaking traffic rules, online tutoring, that we kind of see this in a variety of areas. And your view is there's got to be a role of the system, as you called it. It can't just be saying, well, everybody's going to self-police and we can count on the good intentions of everybody, there's going to have to be some notable guardrails or we're going to find uh, bigger, uh, bigger problems. Then in terms of the future, um, basically some comments, China doesn't want to be the next U.S. That's a kind of call to action in the U.S. about its own system and technology, et cetera. And you were talking about primarily in, in antitrust, but it could be in other areas. Um, another uh, comment that you made is that the individual needs to be the central unit, as opposed to thinking of large, large tech companies, this kind of democratization of the individual and their role is absolutely uh, uh, key. You also said that the future is going to be filled with kind of hardcore tech, that in China, that is where the big advances are going to be, and, and um, that's going to be uh, create unique uh, uh, advantages. And then a couple of other takeaways, again, in this kind of personal advice area. Um, for women, you know, once you're in the room, you said, forget your gender and just do great work and make sure you're helping other women. Don't become somebody that's a, a problem for other women. And my last takeaway, and maybe it's the, the, the most broad and philosophical one, is your comment when you look, you know, U.S. to China, embrace differences and learn to coexist. As opposed to zero-sum game, look at ways that you can actually um, work together. Let me stop on those and say, um, did I get those right? Any, uh, any upgrades you've got or parting comments? Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, you got us, uh, you know, uh, one percent right. The parting comments I want to say is that we are we are living in the time that we're watching the world order is changing, and uh, in the old world, uh, the world order is really shifting from, you know, country politics to country politics, and. Um, as the new generation of innovators and you know leaders, I, I want to encourage us to look at the uh, what I call this kind of a mega system change, right? Globally, so we have been living in the world that are hungry for oil, um, you know, U.S. dollar centric, uh, completely controlled by SWIFT type of uh, you know world order. What we have what we we have seen. Uh, the world's second and third largest economy, and both in Asia, China and Japan, have committed in the next few decades will become net zero. And uh, many companies, um, you know, largest companies in the world, commit you to net zero as well. And particularly for China, China has been relying on oil uh, imports, right? Because China does not have oil, but China has uh, excessive um, electricity because of all the hydro, etc. Mm -hmm. So for China, it's actually very strategic to move to renewable energy, and so you reduce the external reliance. Um, and um, what we're gonna see the this this shift from oil swift US dollar type of the world order might be turning into renewable energy data and um, uh, central bank central bank backed uh, digital currency that does not necessarily have a swift like a, you know centralized um, trusty you know and, and enable this to peer to peer or country to country transactions. So I think, you know, working and understanding this kind of big context to where this world is going um, and uh, therefore build upon in terms of um, the type of digital services that actually, you know, serve the people. And I think you will be heading, doesn't matter what happened with the war, doesn't, doesn't matter which regulation comes out, um, you will be 
on this writing this major trend that's going to last for uh, decades to come. So I wish you all the best, and uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. It's been an amazing discussion, and uh, thank you so much again to allow me to play a small part in this long history of uh, bridge building, very meaningful dialogue. Uh, well, Jennifer, you you actually played a very big part, and I think we couldn't have had anybody better kick off this conference. You know, I mentioned to you during our prep session, and I will say it again now, we could have spent hours with you uh, on a whole variety of topics. And I think it's a real, you know, measure of the multiple experiences you've had, how you've been able to look at private sector, you've looked at public sector issues, you've looked at a variety of technologies, you've looked at issues in China, you've looked at issues in the US, and that's all come to bear in what has been a really interesting, instructive conversation. So let me just say on behalf of UCLA, a huge thank you. And I hope we can have you come back again very soon. With pleasure. Thank you so much, Terry. Excellent. Thank you. Thank all. you.